Hello, this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study where we're currently studying the Gospel of John, chapter 20 today. He's not here, he is risen. In John 20, we experience with Mary Magdalene and the disciples the incredulity of Jesus' resurrection. He's not in the grave any longer. And Mary thinks he's the gardener when she sees him. The disciples are hiding out. They're afraid and they're unwilling to believe when Mary comes to tell them that Jesus is alive. Thomas makes his insistence that unless he has the most unequivocal evidence, he's not going to believe. And in the midst of all this, Jesus makes himself known in unquestioned proof of his resurrection. And we start out reading the first 17 verses of John 20. The first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, to the sepulcher and sees the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runs and she comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, we'll talk about who that other disciple might be, and came to the sepulcher so that they both ran together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying, and yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went in unto the sepulcher, and seeing the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now remember that, that the, the wrapping around Jesus' head was lying separately. We're going to look a little closer at that. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own home. But Mary stood without, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked in to the sepulcher. And seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, the angels, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if you have borne him thence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. So in chapter 20 of John, we find the disciples in hiding and Jesus' earthly body left by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus in a borrowed tomb. After the Passover is over now and and the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb while it is still dark. and She just can't stay away. This is the man. Jesus is the one that has so impacted her life and so saturated her with love, uh, transforming everything about her existence, giving her hope beyond all reckoning. She just 
gravitates even back to this place of finality, the place of the tomb. The disciples, where are they? Jesus' mother, where is she? No doubt Jesus' mother is at John's house. The sword that the angel warned Mary about in the beginning that would pierce her through, well, it's she's experiencing that now, and the pain surely was unbearable for Mary. Uh, and where were Jesus' siblings, his brothers and his sisters that the scripture tells us were a part of his family? They knew that his body still needed preparation. The, the funeral treatment was not complete, and they, they also, in their thinking, knew it would come to this, that Jesus would die, but yet they're thinking more of themselves and their own future than caring about these incomplete funeral rites over their eldest brother, Jesus. But Mary Magdalene, she, she really um, distinguishes herself because she just can't stay away. She, she makes her way down the path and Surely in what was in the dim morning light, she sees something incongruous that the stone is rolled away from the tomb's entrance. Now, she isn't thinking anything supernatural. She's mortified. She doesn't know what's going on. Maybe she thinks that the soldiers that were supposed to guard the grave did something with the Savior's corpse, or perhaps the gardener that she thinks Jesus is later. She thought he might have done something and uh, she didn't want to be denied the opportunity to continue taking care of the treatment of Jesus' body. And uh, she doesn't know how to respond. And she knows where the disciples are in hiding, so she makes the only choice that makes sense. Uh, if you're going to go through something like this, to her mind, Peter. Peter was the man of action, the big fisherman, this bombastic individual, impetuous Peter, well, surely Peter will do something if he does it wrong. Uh, she thinks that they've stolen the body, and she tells Peter and, and don't, doesn't know what's going on, and John wakes up at the commotion with Mary talking to Peter, and Peter's demanding what in the world, and, and so he follows Peter out now. And they both come to the garden tomb. And Peter's probably big, but not as fast. And John uh, outruns Peter and arrives first at the tomb. And he stoops down and he looks in. And before his eyes can adjust, here comes Peter. <laughs> and uh, they see the winding clothes, that, like a mummy, the winding clothes that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had no doubt wrapped the body in, but it's strange to them. Why would the soldiers take care to unwrap the body before stealing it? Because that was the premise they were working on at this point. Um, Peter's looking in as well, and John notices something else that came to his attention that uh, his sense of scrutiny, Peter was probably not a detailed guy. Apart from these cloths that are lying there in the niche where the body of Jesus had lain, John sees the napkin that had been wrapped around Jesus' head lying apart by itself. Now, why would that be mentioned? How come it just wasn't a bunch of grave clothes and who cares about that? What is it about the napkin around Jesus' head that was so noticeable? If you understood the preparation process, you would know that the rosins and spices involved in preparing this cloth to be wrapped around Jesus' head, those rosins would have soaked through the fabric, and in just a few hours, they would have hardened to a stiff shell around Jesus' face. That's what's so different to them. The cloth that was set aside with the other wrappings lay there intact. But this napkin was there in the shape of Jesus' head, like an empty helmet that had Jesus' lifeless face in it, but it hadn't been torn off or unwound. That rosin-soaked cloth had hardened and made a perfect cast of the death mask of Jesus. And now it's laying there empty, intact, defying the understanding of the disciples as to 
what it could mean, how that Jesus' face, his head, could have gotten out of there without tearing the cloth. Now, we know this is Jesus. We know that Jesus can pass through solid objects, even before his resurrection, that he could invisibly avoid angry crowds seeking to lay hands on him to kill him. We know that when he reveals himself to the disciples in just a few hours, he's going to pass through locked doors and appear suddenly among them. What does this sight of the napkin so arranged mean? It means that when Jesus resurrected, the angels attending him didn't loose him through the grave clothes such as the relatives did at Lazarus when Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Jesus didn't need that. Jesus is now in a glorified body. He came to life and he simply sat up, his body passing through the napkin on his face, the wrappings around his body that he was no doubt clothed with. Well, was he naked? Was he standing there naked? No, he was clothed in shining garments that John the Revelator saw. Not as a ghost, but as a resurrected Lord. Uh, the disciples don't understand. They haven't put all this together yet. They can't imagine. They're trying to figure out why would the Romans take Jesus' body away but take time to separate his body from the grave clothes. And they're shaking their heads and they just leave Mary at the sepulcher weeping. Uh, she, Mary, she, she just knows something has happened, but she doesn't know what. And uh, with the two disciples there, uh, having made their exit, Mary looks in again. And she sees something that John and Peter didn't see. The grave clothes are there. The napkin is there that Peter and John saw. But Mary also sees two angels. So they were there. Peter and John just didn't see them. She sees the two angels sitting at either side of the burial niche, looking directly at Mary as the tears stream down her face. Before Mary can say a word, the angels rise to their feet saying, well, why are you crying? <laughs> and what a meaningful, what a telling thing for them to say, being angelic messengers. Their immediate response in the presence of human suffering is to comfort. They're speaking... Uh, Words of comfort. Uh, they're speaking words of consolation to Mary. And she still isn't quite registering what's happening. And so she just blurts out in anguish and uh, in exasperation that, hey, they, someone, has taken her Lord and she doesn't know where he is. And she, she turns away. Imagine that, turning away. She is just right as she was. And there she sees Jesus standing in front of her, but she doesn't know it's him. And he asked her why she's crying, same as the angels. The same question. Mary thinks it's the gardener, and perhaps the gardener saw what happened, and maybe the gardener took the body. Her face is buried in her hands, maybe, and she looks away from who she thinks is a stranger, and then Jesus just simply utters that one word that brings instant realization. Mary. Her world at that moment, her world, and for that matter, all mankind, all the world now is different, is transformed at the utter. It's one thing we call his name, but he calls our name. The master lives. Life itself is standing before her. Divinity in the flesh. Jesus, resurrected from the brutality of the crucifixion, is calling her name. And his first response is not to announce his victory or take a victory lap, but he's there to comfort her. And Mary throws herself at his feet, and before she can touch him, Jesus steps back. There's a lot of mystery there. He raises his hand to caution her, Touch me not, because I've not yet ascended to my father and to your father. See, he's yet to finalize the last details of his earthly task. For all that he's gone through and the triumph that has been accomplished at this point with him coming out of the grave, he can't, he can't just go by and leave her in anguish. He has to say something to her and he has to send word through Mary to take a message to the disciples. What is it that he said again? He said, go to my brethren 
and tell them that I ascend to, to my father and to your father. Not just to his father, but to our father as well. To my God, Jesus said, and to your God. What a consummate statement of redemption. The way is now made manifest. Jesus is now not only the singular Savior, but now he is the firstborn of many brethren. No longer are the heavens to br brass to men crying out to an austere God under Jewish law. The path to the throne has been made open by the consecration of the blood of Jesus. And as he ascends, he's not just ascending for himself, but he's leaving the way open for you and I to follow him and to be seated with him, not in our own value, but in him high above all principalities and powers. Let's read verse 18 through the end of the chapter. Verily I say unto you, no, I'm sorry, verse 18 uh, over here. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at even, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he said on this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins are remitted, you remit, they are remitted. And unto them... And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, Thomas, called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the nail prints put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace unto you. Then said he to Thomas, reach thither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those that have not seen yet, have believed. And many other signs Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So Mary comes to the place where the disciples are gathered, and she's all excited, and she informs them of everything that she saw. And their initial reaction is unrecorded, not being worth John's effort to make a note. Obviously, they're the disrot, they're confounded, they're in despair, they're heartbroken. Perhaps Mary's words fell inert on their ears. They're just in numb disbelief as they're cowering behind locked doors wondering if they're going to be the next to die at the hands of the Romans, at the instigation of the Jews. And in the midst of all that oppressive stillness in that locked, crowded room with 12 guys, Jesus shows up and says, Peace be unto you. And we don't know what their initial response is. Again, they're dumbfounded. They, Perhaps they thought, this is like Jesus walking on the water when they thought he was a spirit. Maybe they think it's a disembodied spirit. But Jesus steps up and invites them to examine the wounds. 
He's gone now and he's returned from the Father. And now they could touch him. Mary couldn't touch him before, but Mary can touch him now. And guess what? You and I can touch him now. Can you see Mary at that moment before Jesus held her back? Now she's at his feet, kissing the nail scars. She doesn't care what the men are saying. She doesn't care what the men are thinking. Jesus has come, and she could pour upon him all her adoration. How would you like to be there with her? Jesus gathers the disciples behind those locked doors that he breached with his glorified body. And he breathes on them. Can you imagine the intimacy of that moment? He calls them to himself and he holds each of their faces in his hand and he breathes upon them the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what would you have done? What, what would you have done? Would you have fainted to the floor? Can you imagine the experience of that? To have the scent of Jesus' garments, the aroma of his breath, the smell of his hands, that close to you? Because if you and I would have been there, we would not have been left out. And in fact, we have not been left out. Because as Jesus breathed upon these disciples, he's breathing upon you and I every day of the world. And what is he saying? Receive the Holy Ghost. Jesus goes on, he declares, he says, Now, whomsoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Something about apostolic authority. We can't make of it something that we shouldn't, but there's something about apostolic authority in that. Things are different now. They're not just disciples. They are now representatives of the throne, ready or not. Of course, Thomas was absent. Jesus, when Jesus showed up, and when he does show up, he doesn't believe. He thinks it's a cruel lie. And he denounces his brothers. And he says he's not going to believe until he handles Jesus' wounds and sees for himself. The disciples, they probably didn't know what to do with Thomas. He doesn't believe it. And they can't convince him. Nevertheless, Thomas stays for eight days with the men. That to him, he must have thought they were Silly zealots are total deceivers. But then Jesus shows up again, and Thomas gasps in realization, and he declares, My Lord and my God. Jesus admonishes him for his unbelief, for his unbelieving heart. He says, It's more blessed to believe when not seen than to demand empirical evidence or some proof of miracles. Oh, I believe when I see a miracle. You cannot get... Peter's outcome with Thomas's faith. Jesus has now opened something up. A having appeared to Mary, having appeared to the eleven, and now Thomas, he stayed there many days and he kept showing and giving them in, in violent proofs, infallible proofs of his resurrection because he wants them to know he's not a ghost. He wants them to know beyond questioning the reality of redemption that has been brought to them and the work that not only has implications for him, but for you and I as well. So, Father, we lay hold on resurrection visitation today and that you would breathe on us as you breathed on them, that we might receive the Holy Ghost afresh and anew, Lord, in Jesus' name. God bless you.